seven. We'll proceed from there and see what else we can learn. All right. So we said that uh, one of the greatest miracles in the ministry of Jesus had taken place, and yet, you know, uh, there were some who believed, but then the others um, were skeptical. We particularly see the Pharisees continuing with their old attitude. And what is that attitude? You know, they are uh, worried about themselves and their earthly life. Okay, uh, and at that point, you know, we are told that there is a, a Caiaphas, who is the high priest, okay, who is the high priest under Pontius Pilate. You know, he was uh, the high priest, uh, and it's not like it says that high priest that year but that doesn't mean that high priests were being changed um, you know every year but it's just that that he was the high priest at that time uh, and you know they kind of uh, wanted some solution to get rid of this Jesus and Caiaphas gives uh, an option he says look uh, it, usually what happens is there is someone uh, among the prisoners who is set, you know, uh, somebody who is, um, okay, just hold on, I'll say it in the words that is given here. Yeah, it is expedient for us that one man should die, sorry, not to set them free, but one man should die for the people and uh, that the whole nation should not perish. Okay. So what Caiaphas is saying, see, look, there, there is a, uh, there is a tradition that we follow where one man is put to death. So he is trying to point out and say that how about we 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 do something to catch this Jesus, and because we have this option, maybe we can we can um, have we can you know kill Jesus something like that. Not necessarily kill uh, in that way, but do it in a formal way, you know, try him and get rid of him some way or the other. So he wanted to do this to uh, get rid of Jesus. But then we know that the word of God prophesies that Jesus will die. And though Caiaphas mentioned it for a nation, which was the Jewish nation, we know that the death of Jesus has brought deliverance. Okay, instead of the nation dying, one man died. Now, instead of the nations paying for the sin uh, that is in mankind, the Lord Jesus paid for it. And so a prophecy was being fulfilled, even though you know, people were acting uh, in uh, their own natural thinking. So God was working out his purposes, even in adverse circumstances. Later on, you know, we see that the plot of uh, uh, trying to kill Jesus, that that became intense and the Jews started working on it in a serious way. At this point, Jesus was aware that if he continues like this, then you know they will catch him. So he escapes. Now he goes to a city called Ephraim and he's over there for a while with his disciples. And the Passover for the Jews was near. We, we know that they had all these festivals that they kept. So Passover, Passover was one of the important festivals uh, and it was approaching. Okay? Uh, and uh, for the festival, there was this tradition that people had to go up to Jerusalem. They had to purify themselves. So uh, at that time, at that time, they were uh, simultaneously, you know, Passover is approaching and at that time, they are uh, seeking to kill Jesus. And this is what was going on. Okay, so that is as much as what we see in the passage. They are basically um, uh, now preparing themselves and they have, you know, knowing Jesus, they know this is a religious man. This is a pious man. So at Passover, he will surely come to the temple. So let's see. Let's figure out how we are going to catch him. So that is the plot. And let's move on to John chapter 12 here. And let's see what is going on. All right, so now it says six days before the Passover. Why is this important? You know, John mentions the timeline. It is important because we know that uh, it's roughly a week before Jesus is seized. Okay, he's caught at the Garden of 
Gethsemane and you know the trial starts off and then Jesus has to be crucified. So he's very, very close, very close to his death. And that is why from chapter 12, in fact, you know, from chapter 12, uh, you would read till, you know, the end of the book of John about what Jesus goes through and the end of his life. Why is John dedicating, you know, so many uh, passages of his writing to the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ? Because it is that important. He has covered 11 chapters talking about the signs of Jesus, the you know, the life of Jesus. And he, uh, in the beginning, you know, showed us how Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah. So we've seen all that. But he is focusing, zooming in on the, uh, the trial of Jesus and the events that take place after that. Because it is equally important. You know, Jesus is fulfilling the purpose of his life through the sacrifice. All right. So that is the reason uh, you know, he's focusing in. And here when he says, sim simply he says, six days before Passover, we can uh, make a note that it's important, very close to uh, the death of Jesus. So one week prior, uh, Passover. Now what happens? Jesus comes to Bethany. Remember we read about uh, Lazarus of Bethany. So Jesus comes to Bethany. And over here, we find that Lazarus, who had been dead, whom Jesus had raised, uh, he was with Jesus. Okay? So there was a supper which was prepared. A supper is an evening meal, generally. And uh, you notice that Martha served. It is likely that uh, Martha, Mary, Lazarus and the family, you know, they had organized this uh, party okay and uh, writers also say that it could have been a very very um, big dinner which they are hosting for the village also why because they were celebrating the resurrection of their brother Lazarus so a Thanksgiving meal if you want to call it or a, a you know, celebratory meal that the uh, family is having here. And at that meal, think about this, how beautiful. The man who rose from the dead is also with Jesus. Okay? And he is spending time with Jesus. So is he doing well? Of course. Was the miracle real? Of course. Four days in the tomb he was stinking. So he was dead. And all the people understood that. And now we are told that Lazarus was one who sat at the table with him. So this is what we understand about the power of God. You know, that something that is dead is now together uh, with Jesus. Okay, I, I'm just saying it in a figurative sense that God is able to restore in that way. That the situation of death can turn into a celebration. But we know that here it is about a man. He was dead. And now that man is fellowshipping with Jesus. And when it says Martha served, so you understand about the personality and the life of Martha as well. That, you know, she clearly liked to take care and host. Uh, and it's not that uh, she was the only one serving, but because... I, I said that looks like it was a large meal. There could have been others from the village helping her and even Mary. Okay, so this is going on in uh, uh, Lazarus, uh, in, in Martha's uh, family dinner. Now, at this point, we read that Mary, she took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard. So uh, we are told what kind of oil? It was spikenard oil. And she took a lot of that oil, anointed the feet of Jesus, wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. Okay, So in those days, they had a tradition. If a guest comes and uh, you want to honor the guest, uh, it seems they would wash the feet with water and they will put the oil on the head of the person. But Mary... Uh, was so 
devoted and dedicated to Jesus that she is expressing her worship by pouring the oil on the feet. Okay, so in a way, it is like worshipping but humbling yourself while you are worshipping. So she's pouring the oil on the feet of Jesus. She's also expressing her um, great worship because there was no need for her to take the whole jar of oil. Okay, we can look at it in many ways and interpret it in many ways. Uh, so maybe, you know, she could have expressed her devotion to an extent, but this is almost like the way David, you know, we read about him. He says, I cannot give to God something that does not cost me anything. So it really costed her. And when we try to study how much could this, this uh, precious perfume uh, had costed Mary, you know, some historians say that it could have even costed like the average salary of a, of a of a like a regular person those days. If you consider that one year salary, that much of a price you know you could pay for the perfume which Mary had, and you're told that she used it a pound of very costly oil of spikenard at one go. She's pouring it at the feet of Jesus or she's anointing his feet and as if that is not enough to express her worship what else is she doing she is wiping the feet with her hair okay again this is like really humbling oneself during worship um, and it was not a common thing people will wipe with a cloth or you know some other article but to wipe with her hair in public was to really humble herself at the feet of the Messiah and bow down and say, God, what you have done for us. But just think about Mary and Martha. They both are expressing uh, their devotion in a certain way. Martha is serving. Mary has anointed the feet of Jesus because their beloved brother, both of them told Jesus, right, that uh, if you were here, you know, teacher, if you were here, Lord, if you were here, this word, my brother would not have died. But now, Jesus is the one who has raised their brother from the dead. So it shows us a heart of thanksgiving. You know, when God does a miracle, sometimes we forget. And uh, that's it. But you see the family here, they never forgot. God raised Lazarus. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And here they are giving thanks in their own ways. Lazarus is sitting with Jesus. Martha is doing her part. Mary is showing her devotion. And we know that, you know, this kind of devotion that Mary showed, it was very special and is talked about a lot uh, in the area of worship. So, you know, we say that uh, in the presence of God in heaven, right, our worship and our prayer is like incense. It goes up before God. And so we can relate it this way. The costly oil of spike nut. That oil, that incense or, or that fragrance which uh, Mary poured at the feet of Jesus, it's like our worship today. As we lift up our worship, extravagant worship, you know, like David and the tabernacle of David, we can connect that to this extravagant worship, costly worship. We humble ourselves before uh, God's presence. We see there that the environment, their house, how was the house of Mary, Martha and Lazarus? filled with worship they were filled with it was filled with the fragrance of that oil and today you know it, it is applicable to us god is working in our lives we are seeing his miracles you know, we know who he is we must be walking in worship and worship should fill our lives so that is the way in which you know uh, these people honored the lord jesus now when this is going on you know, what, what do we observe? There is uh, Judas, okay, one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot. Um, he is not happy when he sees a worship of, of this kind. And we are told that you know, this Judas, Judas is the same one. Later we will see him. Um, you know, the amount for which he betrayed Jesus, it is 30, 30 coins of silver, I think. So 30 coins of silver. How can one sell 
the Messiah for 30 coins of silver. A little bit of money uh, that Judas wanted. For that, he was ready to do anything. And that is the Judas who we are talking about. So Judas, he sees what's going on. And this is his comment. He says, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? So Judas understood. Look at this foolish woman. Expensive oil she's pouring at the feet of Jesus. At that point, he was in charge of the money box. Okay, And it shows us that he was not faithful. Obviously, he must have been taking the money out of the money box in a maybe habitual way. He was doing it. And so he knew that instead of pouring the oil at Jesus' feet, if at all you know, they had sold this uh, uh, fragrant oil and given, he is putting a, a calculation to it. He's saying 300 denarii, which was a lot of money in those days. So 300, the, all that money would have come into the box and then you know Judas could have taken that money. So it is really his ulterior motive. He's not speaking out of a clear conscience. But you see here, Jesus understood. Jesus recognized, you know, the essence of what is being said, what is the, um, the motivation behind it, Jesus recognized it. So Jesus said that let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor, you have with you always, but me, you do not have always. So Jesus also uh, recognized that Judas did not say this because he cared for the poor. Okay, But he cared more about himself. And in the statement that Jesus makes, it seems like you know, Jesus is being very insensitive. Because he's saying the poor you have with you always. Does it mean that God doesn't care about uh, the poor people? No, that's not. See, we have to interpret scripture in the light of scripture. Okay? In so many passages of scripture, we see that God is the deliverer of the poor. God is the one who, you know, blesses uh, the poor. And the poor have uh, a mighty inheritance in God. And he, uh, uh, you know, he stands on behalf of the poor. So he's not saying that he doesn't care about the poor. But instead, what he's saying is, you know, in this situation, the worship which was being offered to him was more uh, required at that point than to consider the needs of the poor. And of course, Judas being a thief, his, his um, intention was to grab the money. So Jesus knowing that he's saying, you know, poor you'll have with you always. So taking this line and saying that um, uh, the poor don't, God, God is not concerned about the poor, you know, that would be wrong. So we look at it in that manner. Okay, so this worship is just so beautiful. Uh, the kind of worship that Mary offered to Jesus and today on the basis of that, you know, we can also offer our best to Jesus. Now, while all this is going on, you know, the plot against Jesus continues. You know, we know that they are waiting. They are just waiting and they are just holding on to uh, uh, getting rid of him because now it's beginning to uh, threaten their position in the society. So we see that uh, a lot of Jews, when they knew that Jesus had come into the vicinity, okay, they they came, okay, not so that uh, they can worship him, but they wanted to catch him. Okay, that, that was one thing. And also, they were not happy with Lazarus. So sometimes people are not happy with the miracle that God has done also. So not only do they want to destroy, um, you know, who, the, the knowledge of who God is, but they also want to destroy the evidence. So they want to uh, kill Jesus, but we also read that they wanted to kill Lazarus. Okay? It has come to that now. However, you know, Jesus is uh, continuing with his work. There are some people 
who did put their trust in Jesus. So both things are happening. You know, the plot is happening as well as people are coming closer to God. Now, the next day, now that uh, they had this wonderful meeting and worship uh, uh, in uh, the, the, you know, at that dinner uh, and Jesus, you see, Jesus is aware of the timings. Earlier he said, my time has not come. Now, when Mary poured the oil, what did he say? He said, she's preparing me for my burial. So is Jesus aware that soon he is going to die? Yes, he is clear on that. So the next day, you know, there was a great multitude who had come. They had come for the feast. And uh, we know, right, the Passover is around the corner. And uh, people would, uh, you know, go for their purification to the temple. So all that preparation is going on. So at this time, no, there were those who believed in Jesus, those who honored Jesus. And when they heard that Jesus was around, they, they came to see. They came to see. They took with them palm branches and they went out to meet him. Okay, And they cried out. What did they say? They said, oh, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. So there are those who recognize him as Messiah. Uh, if you know, even today, you know, the church... We follow this, right? A lot of traditional churches follow one week before um, Good Friday. Uh, you have Palm Sunday uh, because that is uh, like in in um, recognition of the way the multitudes greeted Jesus as the Messiah. So they took all these palm branches, they went and they greeted him. And we see that Jesus, he sat on a donkey at that point and he uh, kind of you know moved from there all of this whatever is going on uh, it was actually the fulfillment of a prophecy okay here itself you have that uh, scripture it says john writes he says uh, as it is written so look at the life of jesus it is going by the timeline of god and it is going by the word of god the prophetic word of god fulfilling uh, you would say messianic prophecy there are, uh, I think, up to around, I don't know how many, 400 prophecies or, or more than that. So every time something is fulfilled, like Jesus being born in Bethlehem is a fulfillment of a messianic prophecy. Uh, and now you know, Jesus sitting on the donkey in itself is a messianic prophecy. So John confirms that. He says, as it is written, fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming sitting on a donkey's colt. So, you know, he uh, uh, reconfirms that Jesus is the Messiah. But unfortunately, the disciples did not understand that all these prophecies were being fulfilled. Only later, you know, when uh, Jesus died, rose from the dead, and, you know, as they, the early church was birthed and things were going on, uh, John writes, he says, only later they understood, oh, every small incident in the life of Jesus was actually him walking in what was already written. Yeah, so uh, this is going on and, uh, you know, people are honoring Jesus and at the same time, you know, the Jews are getting more and more insecure. And uh, remember, Lazarus is raised from the dead. Before that, the blind man who was blind from birth could see. And they are thinking the crowds have started recognizing this man. And one more wonderful thing is that the claims of Jesus, they didn't believe. Okay, But now they started believing, uh, uh, as he said, believe in the works. They started believing the works also, that these are supernatural works. No ordinary man can do this. But there is still unbelief in their hearts. Okay, How puzzling, isn't it? The works, they've recognized it. And they themselves are saying, oh, Lazarus, better kill him. Because this is the man who rose from the dead. But are they ready to um, you know, give him his position as Messiah? No. So it just shows how deceived people can be, how taken over people can be by worldliness. They were happy with uh, everything the world had to offer them. 
and they did not want anything to take it away from them so they are continuing to do what plotting okay we better get rid of this man he may be uh, the messiah but you know it's okay we are we just want our life to be comfortable so unbelief and their their hardness of heart is what is uh, uh, you know again coming to our coming to the picture here now when this is going on there are some people they come and they ask to meet jesus okay they come to philip and they say um sir we wish to see jesus some greeks they came and uh, they wanted to see jesus and uh, uh, i don't know why uh, philip uh, goes and he tells andrew instead of straight away going to jesus then andrew uh, in turn and andrew and philip okay they together they go and they tell jesus but you know jesus makes a statement he says this he says uh, the hour has come that the son of man should be glorified so he recognizes he recognizes that this is the time when he is going to die and he is making a statement about his death and uh, you know not really uh, responding to what uh, philip and andrew are telling him that okay some greeks have come and they want to see you jesus so what is jesus saying he is saying look unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies it remains alone but if it dies it produces much grain he who loves his life will lose it and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life if anyone serves me let him follow me and where i am there my servant will be also if anyone serves me him my father will honor so you know jesus has become speaking more and more about what is going to happen to him in about a week's time okay now these greeks they came to meet jesus um now why they came to meet jesus the exact reason uh, at that point even philip and andrew did not know but jesus is recognizing that you know now there is this this whole um uh, mixed crowd some are believing and some are going to give him up to death but he's talking about fulfilling the mandate for which god sent him and he is saying this in a figurative way uh, initially he say a grain of wheat which is himself okay, which is himself you will understand that it is about himself it falls to the ground and it dies now when we talk about seeds okay you put it into the ground what happens you know is it the death of the seed what do you think you put a seed in the ground is it the end of that seed no it's not the end of the seed isn't it a seed will always produce but for the producing or the multiplying of the seed a death is required so jesus is saying that once he dies though satan and even at that point you know the 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 people who were against it they thought that it's going to be the end of all these wonderful works that jesus is doing actually it is going to be the beginning of life flowing out of him so it, he says but if it dies it produces much grain you know so the way god works sometimes it's mysterious we think it is the end but it is actually the beginning okay and over here we we also you know we can apply the scripture and we say that in our lives as we uh, allow the spirit of god to lead us you know paul wrote he said be led by the spirit walk in the spirit be don't be drunk by one but be drunk in the spirit okay uh, and when we do these things we will glorify god for us to walk in the spirit one more requirement is that we must die to our flesh okay or the way uh, you know paul paul wrote about dying to self uh, i die daily so death actually produces life okay uh, when we are walking in obedience to god and jesus knew that and jesus uh, was trying to reveal this to his 
disciples and say that, look, I'm not even the kind who's going to hold on to my own life, but I'm going to obey God. And when I die, I know that this life which is in me, it is going to multiply, it is going to touch the nations. Many are going to be saved and a mighty work of God is going to be done. So that's what he's saying when he says the wheat of uh, a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies. It remains alone, but if it dies, it produces much grain. Okay? And he wanted, he expected the same kind of a commitment from his disciples. So he told them also, if you're going to uh, lose your life, you'll actually find it. Uh, and if you want to follow me, if anyone says, I want to follow God, you know, uh, in other passages also, we've seen Jesus say this. He says, like, um, you cannot follow two masters. You cannot be um, a follower of money and of God also. Okay. Where does our commitment lie? Who are we willing to die for? If we are here to serve Jesus, you know, it is, it is not always going to be pleasant. Sometimes it is going to take sacrifice. Sometimes it could take sacrificing one's life. And that is something, uh, see John, who is writing this, this uh, uh, book, he was one of the disciples who lived longer than the others. But he has observed the martyrdom of uh, his colleagues. Okay, the other disciples. He's seen before his eyes, James died, you know, Peter died. And, so many people actually were martyred for the gospel. But John lived on. He lived up to an old age, right, before he died. So how come John is, John also has an understanding of the sacrifice? Because he understood that it's not just about dying. Okay, some may sacrifice to that extent, but... The important thing is to have a heart that says, God, even if it comes to that, I'm willing to uh, walk a committed life to you. Remember Thomas, he said, okay, God, Jesus, you are, uh, okay, well, let us go with him. Let us also die with him. So it's the state of our heart which says, I'm committed to that extent. It's not whether or not, you know, we are going to die, literally die uh, for Christ. Uh, but then you know, we can also say that physical death, yeah, that that has that is one subject to discuss about. But the sacrifices, the dying to the flesh, the dying to our own desires, you know, that is also a very hard thing on a day-to-day -day basis. And that is why we say, especially ministers of God, right? It is a high calling, and it's going to take high standards. It's going to take. You know, a high commitment. It's going to take um, uh, that that uh, passion and devotion to God, where we are saying, "Okay, I'm going to serve God, and uh, you know, I'm going to honor God, and even if it means that I I need to lose uh, some of the things I desire, I'm willing. Okay? I'm willing to uh, live that life. So basically, it's about the high commitment." that we see Jesus um, revealing here. Let's move on. At this point, we'll see, we'll start observing that Jesus himself, okay, he's fully man, remember? So uh, he'll go through his challenges, preparing himself for what is coming up, you know, in a natural sense, but also preparing himself in a spiritual sense, having a full understanding that what is going to take place now is the word of God and that he is fulfilling uh, that prophetically. So it says that Jesus, he was troubled. He's, he says, my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? He's really um, showing his humanity. He even says, Father, save me from this hour. But then, you know, it's, it's like that battle which is going on within him. He's so close to doing what God has called him to do. He's saying, God, save me from that hour. And then in the next breath, he's saying, but this is the purpose for which I have come. Father, glorify your name. So it's like the final battle is going on inside of him. And uh, he is preparing himself. And God also 
affirms him god strengthens him because there is a voice that comes from heaven uh, and and that voice says i have both glorified it and will glorify it again so god what is god doing through the life of jesus god is glorifying his name and look at this so the son of man the son of god call it whichever way now the um, people who greeted him uh, when when he came on the donkey they said king of israel call him whatever as the messiah but what was the purpose of his life the glory of god so today you know my life and your life each one of our lives what is the purpose of our lives you know we can uh, have certain positions we can have responsibilities you know, we can um, be serving uh, in certain areas but whatever it is whatever we are here to do the purpose of god for each of us ultimately what is the goal of our lives to glorify god and that is what you see god saying here to jesus yes i have both glorified it and i am going to glorify it again but the people around they did not hear what was told it looks like so jesus heard the word words but the people around him uh, they heard something thunder so it was noise to them okay uh, then again you know jesus says that this voice did not come from me because jesus did not need uh, supernatural things to believe in god at this point he had he had very comfortably established a strong relationship a good relationship with the father but he's saying that look all these signs and we know right the jews were people who wanted signs all the time so uh, in a way it was for their sake and that's what jesus said look this thunder happened for you and uh, i want you to recognize that you know i am in the purpose of god and jesus makes a wonderful statement verse 31 he says now is the judgment of this world now the ruler of this world will be cast out and i if i am lifted up from the earth will draw all people to myself so this jesus is proclaiming a uh, confirming all that will take place together with his death see one thing he knows is that he is going to die okay and that god is going to be glorified now what are the results or what is the outcome of such a death that god has um asked jesus to go through so there are other results what is one thing here verse 31 it says that the judgment of this world is now okay and the ruler of this world will be cast out so when jesus dies this was also an ultimate goal what is it that satan would be judged that satan would be cast out now people ask the question uh satan is still in the world why did jesus say that the ruler of this world so that is one of the ways of describing satan satan is described in many with many names satan the accuser um uh, he is the the adversary you know he is uh, the the god small god not g capital g but small g god of this world so he has many names like this but here it is mentioned as the ruler of this world referring to satan he is still in the world he did not really get thrown out of this world but what did jesus mean he meant the victory where the authority has been shifted so cast out really refers to the authority and the influence that satan had on the world okay we know what did jesus say you know before uh, he was um, uh, like before he ascended he said all authority on the he- heaven and earth is is mine now i give it to you unless jesus had taken the authority from satan uh, how could he give it to us okay and how is it that satan got this authority because of sin that entered the world sin entered through the disobedience of adam and eve okay and because of that when we read about the temptation of jesus there we see what what does uh, satan tell jesus okay come i will give you look at all the kingdoms of the world i will give you the authority of all these kingdoms because by that time uh, the authority had been 
taken over by Satan because man had sinned. Now, what was the task that Jesus had before him? Through his death, he needed to take back that authority. And that is why we see it says the ruler of this world will be cast out. It has to do with authority. The authority which he has, Jesus is going to take it away from him. And that's what he's saying. He's saying, if I die, then the ruler of this world will be cast out. His authority is going to be taken away from him. So now we are believers. Okay? And the death of Jesus, this is our victory. Why? We say Good Friday. Why? Why is it good? Right? One of the reasons is that, you know, the ruler of this world has been cast out or Christ Jesus has brought back that authority and given it to mankind. And now you and I can walk in authority because of what Jesus had done. And that is why we see that struggle within Jesus. He's saying, you know, uh, save me from this hour. And other breath he says, but for this purpose I came. He's going through it, but he wants to make sure that he does what the Father has asked him to do so that the ruler of this world will be cast out and that authority will be given back to us. And at the same time, you know, he also says another purpose uh, for which he has come is, you know, he says that I am lifted up, I will draw all peoples to myself. Now notice this, this, whole, uh, this whole work that God was planning to do was Yes, for the children of Israel. Now, when Jesus ministered even to that lady uh, whose child was demon possessed earlier, we saw that, you know, the uh, Syrophoenician lady. We see, he says, the children's bread cannot be given to the dogs. So he has come here with an agenda for the Jewish people, for Israel. But look at this. When Jesus is crucified on the cross, he's saying, one is Satan is going to be defeated. Second is that I will draw all people to myself. So not just the Jews, but the gospel will be able to go out to the Gentiles, you know, to the uh, name other communities, different communities, Greek, just no end to the ends of the earth. And that is why before his ascension, Jesus was able to say, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. So he's able to uh, do this through the death that he is going to die. So Satan will be defeated. The gospel is going to go out to everyone. Now, mm, people, you know, when they hear Jesus saying all these things, uh, they are confused. You see, the understanding of the prophetic word, people were not aware at that point. So they are asking this question. So they are saying, uh, we, have we have heard, uh, that the Christ remains forever. Uh, so how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? In their hearts, in one way, they were, you know, they, they were happy with Jesus. They were convinced that here is a miracle worker. Here is a man who is able to perform signs and wonders. He is with us. Okay, maybe uh, we, we found the ruler whom we are looking for. And of course, you know, we know that people had also put their faith in him as the Messiah. So they did not want this person to go away. So they are saying, look, in our understanding, we know that this Christ is supposed to be that, uh, you know, the government shall be upon his shoulders. You're going to be there forever as our ruler. What are you talking about? So what does it mean for the Son of Man to be lifted up? And, uh, you know, the uh, who is this? Son of man, they're getting confused. But again, Jesus is reiterating and he's kind of trying to prepare their hearts for what is going to come up soon. You know, matter of a week, all these events are going to start uh, transpiring. So he says, look, a little while longer, the light is with you. Remember what did Jesus say about himself? He said, I am the light of the world. How did John introduce Jesus? The light shines in the darkness. So Jesus is saying, I'm going to be with you. The, their question is, who is the son of man? Jesus is trying to tell them again, I am only that son of man. And he is using the term light to describe. For a little while, I am with you. While you have 
the light okay uh, uh, you know you you just you just be strong don't let the darkness overtake you and uh, believe in the light okay? believe in the light that you might become the sons of the light so in a hidden hidden way okay or, or you could say um jesus is speaking directly but they needed spiritual understanding to grasp what he's saying so uh, overall he's preparing their hearts he's preparing them to receive what uh, is going to happen the death the the uh, burial the resurrection of himself and he's saying that he is the messiah okay so what i'll do is i think i'll just uh, pause at this point and uh, we we will take some time uh, to just hear from each of you if there's anything from today that has touched you or you know, you've learned from it maybe you could share uh, and with that we will close we will pray towards the end we'll, we will close so yeah is there anything that uh, you feel has touched you okay so you could think about it because uh, you know we have um, really seen some wonderful things right today we've seen the resurrection of uh, lazarus we've also seen the uh, the way jesus was worshiped with that uh, spike mid fragrance okay uh, and we we see how jesus is so committed to his purpose so uh, a lot of a lot of things for us to Uh, really meditate on so i'm just going to leave you with that uh, and how about we close uh, with a word of prayer i just want to request either aren or kiran one of you to please pray so we can wrap up today's session i'll pray first yeah yeah go ahead aren Thank you for thank you Lord for letting us know the truth from the book of um John oh Lord for us we journey our life with you Lord give us all the um compassion and love as we um represent you in this world Lord and Lord let us all walk by faith not by sight even in the lowest day of our life so Lord so so that so that we won't be shaken by any storm so Lord let us all fix our heart our mind our eyes in you alone till our last breath so lord father bless everyone and i submit the rest of this session into your loving hand in jesus name i pray amen amen thank you, amen. Thank you. yes thank you both of you god bless okay and uh, we will meet in the uh, next session thank you pastor yeah thank you bye for now